Hello everyone, are you ready to be entertained? It's been a long week, but fear not, because I have some incredible stories to share with you today. Welcome to this week's compilation. If you missed any of our previous videos or simply want to rewatch them, you're in luck. Just click like and subscribe to our channel for more amazing stories like the ones you're about to see. Don't forget to take note of the timestamps for your favorite stories and leave them in the comments section below. We always love to hear from our viewers and appreciate your feedback. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Teachers, what's the most depressing thing your kids have said? Viewers edition. Ah, nothing like reading stories from our awesome comment section, even if the prompt does have depressing in the title. I'm going to content warning you all right now. We're going to have some stories dealing with trauma, mental illness, and self-destructive thoughts up to and including thoughts of taking one's own life. It isn't easy, but I'm here to support those of you who were willing to share. I hope your stories can help some others going through similar tough times. Let's get into it. Story 1. I'm the kid that had a teacher who had a great teacher but broke his heart. I had trouble as a teen, lots of stuff I could go into, but most of it boils down to identity and familial issues. One day I was just so sad I didn't have the energy to put on my usual happy mask that I had. I was known as the kid that laughed at literally anything. I smiled and cracked jokes even when I was dying inside. When I just straight up couldn't put the mask on because it was just too much effort, I was brought outside to the hall and asked what was up. I told them that I wasn't sure I was going to come to school next week. I was planning on killing myself because at the time my family was always fighting, I had no friends, I felt like I was annoying to everyone even when all I said was hello and the only living thing I cared about at the time had died a week prior, my dog, who I got when I was five. When I told him all that, he asked if I wanted a hug, and I broke down crying like a dam had broken. I still feel bad for him, because a week later, I attempted, but not completed, self-termination. When I woke up in the hospital from blood loss and lacerations on my arm, it was then I actually felt like I let him down worse than I let anyone else, because I promised him I'd keep going and make something of myself. Instead, I was sitting in a hospital bed barely a week later. Mr. T was a fantastic science teacher, and I still credit him today as to why I'm an endocrinology researcher. Biology is awesome, and I wish I could tell him that, but I don't have his contact information, and the school he worked at closed three years after I graduated. I was only 14 at the time, but I remember how he treated me. Story 2. Not a teacher, but a student. I knew another student who was not very well. Her parents would often hit her, and she would come to school with bruises. Soon she developed ED, and I tried to help her. She started talking about how if she was gone, nobody would care or notice except me. It was obvious that the teachers didn't like her because she would often sleep in class due to low energy. To make things worse, she had ADHD, and her grades were dropping miserably. Most of the students were mean to her and bullied her most of the time. One time she came into class telling me that she would say goodbye today. At first, I didn't know what that meant, but as I thought about it, I realized. Quickly, I told the teacher and the counselor. They instantly called her into the counselor's office. Today, she is now well, and we still keep in touch. Story 3. Not a teacher, but this happened to my little sister. It was around the holidays, and our grandma was coming to visit. My sister wanted to make her a drawing and said she was going to work on it at school. That day, she came home crying. The kids in her class took her drawing from her hands, looked at it, and laughed. They ripped it and said, Don't cry, I'm just showing you how much you suck at art, and you won't be able to accomplish anything in life. She was also constantly bullied by her class. But what makes my heart hurt the most is that she's been told to unalive herself more than seven times. By the way, this happened when she was eight. Luckily, she's okay now, and her art skills have improved, and she finally has friends. I'm just so mad at how heartless people can be. Story 4. I'm not a teacher, I'm just a student, but I can say that there are times when I broke down in front of them or just in the classroom. This one time, despite doing all of my work, I got lunch detention, even though I shouldn't have gotten it. Normally I don't mind, but last time I was in lunch detention, someone took a photo of me and made fun of the way I eat. They got in trouble, but I was still anxious after that. So when the teacher said I had to stay in, I was mad, but also really sad at the same time. I could barely focus on studying because I was crying. The teacher asked if I wanted to eat, and I said no, I just wanted to get it over with. I finally managed my feelings when I decided to go to the bathroom to wash my face a bit. I noticed the teacher who originally assigned it to me, and they said, So, did you do it? And I just couldn't stop myself from crying right in front of them. They said, Oh, um, okay, and walked away. 
Another time was when I had a 30-minute detention, so when it was 3.30 p.m., I asked to leave because it was 30 minutes. But because the teacher was never informed of the new rules of detention, she said that she never heard of it, so I had to stay another 30 minutes. I tried to protest, but she kind of scares me, so I just stopped myself and did some reading homework. I was really upset because my mom was waiting outside for me, and she hasn't been feeling well for the past three years, and I don't want her to wait another 30 minutes. So for the next half hour I was there, I just sobbed silently. There's even this one time, but first, before I say anything, this has to do with the cheese touch. If you don't know what it is, it's basically like a tag, but I think it's just a tactic to get away from someone. Basically, if people are playing, someone who has it would touch someone, and they would touch someone else. It doesn't matter if they're playing or not, apparently. Yeah, however, if your fingers are crossed, you're safe. So when my friend told me about it, I was really anxious, so I kept my fingers crossed. Even though I wasn't playing the game, I wanted to make sure nobody touched me. Then this kid, who I don't get along with that well, but don't hate at the same time, touched my shoulder, and I got goosebumps all over. Then my friend said, that's not fair, she had her fingers crossed and she didn't even want to play. But the kid didn't listen. I wasn't crying, but I was still disgusted and upset at the situation. I don't like it when people randomly touch me, especially on my shoulder or literally anywhere. Even though the teacher told them to stop, they didn't. One time, the superintendent's daughter complimented my friend for some drawing and then went up to me, and instead of saying something to me like she did with my friend, she touched my shoulder and ran away. I actually was so tired of this. I broke down and I was like, I don't want to play. Why don't they see that? I get bullied a lot in school. The other students would make fun of the way I eat, the way I sit, the way I talk, the way I answer questions, the way I do workouts, the way I play games, the way I live my own life. There are multiple times that I doubted that I could do anything in the future, that I'm too ugly for people to like me, and that I'm too dumb to get anywhere in life. <laughs> There's this one time I tried to kill myself. My whole school is sexist, the students, really. They prioritize the boys more than the girl to the point where there's a girls versus boys thing when playing games. Other than school, there's a lot of bad stuff I've been through. Toxic relationships and family problems, a whole lot of them. I took this character quiz and it asked what types of problems I have. For example, social anxiety, abandonment issues, etc. And you know what? I clicked every option there was. There were only six options. Other than the I never experienced this option. My sisters think I'm ugly and stupid, well, most of them, some think I need to get a life, and my only brother keeps staring at me and it makes me so uncomfortable. I actually wrote this essay with a bunch of swear words about my family, mainly my brother. CPS has been called, but because we seem normal, nothing happened really, though they came for months, and after that my mom was so anxious about everything we did and things that we'd do wrong, she'd blame us for the reason why CPS came. For my mom, everything is transactional. My older sister got in a fight with her, and all mom would say is how much she bought for her, and that she is so nice for buying all of that. My siblings always blame me and never listen to me either. My parents always take the siblings' side rather than mine, and I really just don't see why. I talk to my teachers a lot after classes, but only academic stuff. Like in Spanish, I would say, blah blah, I'm learning this in French, or something like that, something that relates to the class. I was a really good student who did nothing wrong back when I was little, and in fourth grade it all flopped. Maybe it was because the work got harder, maybe it was the teacher, or COVID. In fact, my family is most positive that I had COVID in fourth grade because I was absent for two to three weeks and was super sick with all of the symptoms of COVID. However, COVID wasn't really known back then. That was the year it started getting known, though. In fact, it was only three months after I was healthy again that quarantine hit. I guess some could say I have issues, but I don't know. Sorry I wrote a lot, I just had a lot to say. If anyone read this far, congrats to you, you know my life now. Well, it looks like I know a bit more about you now, and thanks for sharing. I'm not going to lie, that is tough, and while I dealt with a few similar things in school, I can't pretend to know exactly how you feel or what you've dealt with. I think therapy could be a lot of help, but I also understand how that might not be attainable in your situation. I'll just share this. Find the people who lift you up, embrace your corner of the world, and learn that bullies and jerks are folks with their own problems, and frankly, their opinions shouldn't mean much to you if you don't like them. It isn't always easy, and honestly, some days are friggin' rough, seriously. But school is also such a terrible indicator of what your life could be like. 
My life as an adult is completely different. I have so much more control over the people I am around. I've grown into my passions and been able to fully embrace myself. It's not an easy road to travel, but the destination has been more than worth it. I'm sorry that you are dealing with walking a much harder path than many other kids have to walk. That sucks. It isn't fair. But keep on walking it, and one day you'll say that you conquered it. What's the most messed up thing at your school? Viewer's edition. All right, comment section, you told us your messed up school stories, and we picked some of our favorites. And boy, some of them really are messed up. Story one. In middle school, there was a fight going on, two kids beating each other up because one was being racist or something, and a very packed crowd started to form around them. Since it was when we were switching classes, literally everyone was out, and they decided to fight right in the middle so nobody could get up or down the stairs past them nowhere. That was the only spot leading to the other side of the school where most people's classes were. It got so tight in the crowd that I couldn't breathe for a solid two minutes and almost passed out as I was trying not to fall over from the people shoving me around because if I did, I'd be trampled and most likely suffer some serious injuries or worse. Everyone was pushing, trying to see what was happening. As a short person, I couldn't see anything and had no clue what was happening, and it was very easy to shove me around, especially when I literally couldn't breathe. About two teachers were trying to get to the people fighting, but the crowd was just way too tight since they had extremely small hallways. I guess the security was on break because nobody was there. I got shoved around so much that I was eventually pushed to the railing where the transition of the stairs were and almost fell over the edge. We were on the second floor and it was about a 30 to 40 foot drop. I managed to slide myself over along the railing outside of the crowd, getting hit in the head by some jerks who were using me as a liftoff. I finally made it out, literally gasping for breath and waited for the crowd to clear out since I had to get to the other side of it to get to my next class. As I was getting my breath back, some randos started giving me dirty looks and said I was being dramatic when I literally didn't even do anything to them. Once it cleared, I went to class. The teacher got mad at me for being late. The end. Literally, nobody cared. Some kid went to the hospital after falling over and getting stomped on. She then got to know the luxuries of a wheelchair. Still, nobody cared. No teachers talked about it. They contacted the parents about a week later. This all happened on the second day of school in 8th grade, so yeah, now I'm in virtual school because I'd rather not go through that again. Most terrifying moment of my life. That sounds genuinely pretty scary. I'm glad you managed to get out okay because a rowdy crowd is damn dangerous. It sucks, but large groups of angry or excited people are really freaking unpredictable and almost impossible to fight against. I'm not always a huge fan of remote schooling, but I 100% think you made the right choice after going through that. Story 2. At my high school, it's an all-girls school, and the upper six formers would mess up the school in a funny but non-damaging way. They basically stuck up funny messages of getting detentions and things for dancing on tables or being cringe that they would edit themselves and put shaving foam on the stairs, and it was quite funny. The next day, the lower six tried to do a similar thing, but it was worse. They flipped over the desks in most classrooms and held everything together with string and would walk into random classes throughout the day and annoy everyone with air horns and junk. But the worst part was in the main bathroom. They took pads, put bright red paint on them, and stuck them all over the place. And they left the paint there, too, so everyone painted all over the place. Most people felt uncomfortable, and then the lower six had to send an apology email. Story 3. When I was 12 and just moving into this new school, there was a kid who was constantly bullied. I tried to talk to him, but he always pushed me away, so I focused on dealing with my own problems with bullying. He was being constantly favored by the teachers who all seemed to dislike him, which was very strange. Six months in, we go on winter break, and when we're back, the principal disappears just didn't show up for his job for a few weeks and then got officially fired. When he got fired, the bullied kid also disappeared. A year later, I found out that the principal, a married man, was having intercourse with multiple parents and the bullied kid's mom was his favorite. She was also married. This is a Seventh-day Adventist institution and you can see how it'd become a scandal. The kid's mom pulled him out of school and moved to Brasilia, 
No idea what became of them. I was trying to predict where this story was going, and I've got to say, wasn't expecting that. I'm not sure why I didn't expect infidelity to enter into this thread. It is a thread with teachers in it, and while I think most of you teachers are great, there are plenty of you who have a real problem keeping pants on. I just hope things were okay for all the kids in the story in the end. Story 4 the most effed up thing that ever happened at my school was in ninth grade and had me involved and I got expelled for it. Sure, I could have handled it differently, but in the moment I wasn't thinking straight. There was a gang of five guys who always used to pick on this one kid. It usually turned into him getting beat up pretty frequently. I was already on my second strike for getting involved with them in two previous encounters and I was really trying to keep my peace to myself, but I was already in a bad mood, but having a crappy morning, so... What happened is, we went to the cafeteria as usual, I sat down in the farthest corner of the room cause I don't like to socialize when I eat. And lo and behold, here come the five jackbutts with their plates empty, which I found strange cause I generally never missed eating. Then I saw them walking over to the guy that they regularly bully and in turn they work the cafeteria plate. You know, those crappy little tin plates, anyone who's been in the cafeteria knows what I'm talking about, over the back of this guy's head in rapid succession. Leave the other day, didn't start off, that crap is gonna get ugly at that point, to them last, and took a swing at me. No, I'm not gonna go into detail, cause there was a lot of blood, but the gist is of it is, I ended up hospitalizing three of them. I leaving the other two with about, I think it was 17 and 19 stitches and severe scarring among many other things. A reconstructed jaw, cheek, false teeth implanted, a broken arm, and shattered fingers. I went to anger management and had was prescribed two psychologists for the next four months and then homeschooled myself for two and a half years, then joined the military I've currently been serving for nine years. Sorry if that was a little hard to follow, folks. That was all written as one sentence. Fighting to defend a kid is something I won't necessarily condemn. A complete lack of punctuation? Well, that condemns itself. I'm giving you some guff commenter, but in all seriousness, I hope you're happier now, and thanks for your service. Story 5. I have a few, actually. Last week, three kids got stabbed with rusty compass needles in my class. One went to the hospital. A friend of a friend was shot after refusing to, get, to give drugs to a gang member who went to our high school a while back. I learned of it through my friend. A group of kids were being assaulted by my girlfriend after her father got into a motorcycle accident and was in the hospital for a long time. I distinctly heard one of them say, too bad you weren't with him. I have no idea why this happened. She's very popular and well-liked by essentially everyone in the school. Four 11th graders were arguing about what the best mouse for Minecraft is. At one point, the biggest of them tried to strangle one of the others, and he only got a detention. The guy who was being strangled passed out at one point. Teachers get to decide who's allowed to make out at our school. If they like the students, or at least one of them, for all they care, if the students are quiet enough, they can do anything except actual intercourse. If they don't like both of them, they aren't allowed to do crap. I'm one of the lucky ones. This school sounds frankly a little intense for me, in all regards. I grew up in a town in northern Minnesota, so we had no gangs and violence and all that was pretty rare. Honestly, my time in high school was pretty boring compared to most of these stories. I'm not sure how you all handle this kind of violence and intensity, but I do genuinely worry about the students in big schools these days. Do me a favor and stay safe, okay? Story 6. I've got one. I once saw a girl with her friends get pulled a knife on by a super creepy boy. The boy had been stalking her all two years they went to the same school, and he made a blood oath to her by cutting his hand with a pocket knife. He also hacked her email and grades. Her friends were deeply concerned, and the first year of the new school they were both in the same class. The second year they weren't, and one Thursday the boy was absent, so the girl decided with her friend to take a date to get the boy off her back. The next day the boy came back and heard the news from a gossip girl in his class. He then at recess pulled the knife. The girl quickly told the recess monitor, and he only got suspended for 10 days. The girl was super scared all the time. Plot twist number one, this was in sixth grade at a gifted school. The next year, the girl was in an advanced homeroom, so every class she had the same people. The people in your homeroom share every class. 
She came to find out he was in her homeroom, a.k.a. all her classes, and her mother set a meeting with the school, who did nothing about it. It was a rough and stressful year for her. He's still a creep to this day. Plot twist number two, that girl was me. Parents' Tricks That Messed Children Up, Viewer's Edition. We read about how other folks' parents messed them up, but we wanted to know how they messed you, our viewers, up. These are your stories from the comments. Content warning, some of these stories address mental trauma and abuse. Story 1. I think what definitely effed up my life is the fact that my parents played favorites in a far worse way than you'd usually expect. I was blamed for everything so often that my parents even admitted that they say my name by accident when something goes wrong. I was often bullied throughout elementary school, which absolutely destroyed my mental health and capacity for emotion. I was even told how I was so upbeat back in the day. Frankly, I don't even remember when I was that way. All I remember is the constant bullying, mistreatment on the teacher's part and my parents, and even their abuse. My brother was pretty much held on a podium, which made things even worse. He would make A's all the time while I would make C's. I was constantly compared to my brother in that regard, and it was extremely degrading. They never questioned why I would make B's and C's so often that in fact was their own fault on top of my ADHD. It got so bad, in fact, that I would constantly have nightmares about my dad yelling at me and punishing me, and sometimes I woke up screaming. This was all during my elementary school years, at least the worst of it. I also had thoughts of taking my own life and even constantly imagined taking a kitchen knife and slaughtering my entire family during that time. I was that traumatized. Thankfully, it's a lot better, but my parents could still use some work. Middle school wasn't much better. I had a lot less bullies, but this time I had a friend that was definitely not normal. Not only was he an extreme narcissist, but he was really good at manipulating my brother into thinking I was the bad guy. It didn't help that he had OCD as well, so he would do all of this really degrading crap while no one else noticed right in front of my brother. He even forced me to admit when I was wrong even though I wasn't. Now that I'm familiar with some more terms, that was definitely some really crazy gaslighting. Thanks to the crap I've been through, I'm not quick to anger. I might display frustration, but that's the most anyone will get. There was one day where I had enough and proceeded to 1v2 him and my brother at the same time. I got so peed that I couldn't feel a thing the entire time no matter how many punches they landed. Unfortunately, the fight was ended by the counselor who didn't understand a thing. High school wasn't much better until my senior year. I still had thoughts of taking my own life from time to time, which was not fun in the slightest. In the last semester of my senior year, I was going to write a comment on here regarding what happened during middle school. Unfortunately, I copy-pasted it into Google Docs on my student account, which detects some key words. I was brought up to the counselor's office and lied about the whole thing, saying someone probably accessed my account to say those things. But I wouldn't have gotten through it without my friends. They uplifted me and supported me every step of the way, and I can't thank them enough. I even got invited to one of their graduation parties, which was a blast. When I got distinguished honors at my graduation, my mother asked me why my brother didn't get it too. Can't you just let an achievement be mine? I'm in college, and they still do this. When my brother told them he made B's and C's, they comforted him, but when I made A's and B's while explaining to them that I had an absolutely horrible semester, they still shunned me for it. I'm currently breezing through Calculus 2 and all of my other classes while he made a 40 on his first Calculus 1 exam. He's even got a damn tutor. I haven't studied for years and I still got a B in that class, Calc 1. And that's with me during that cluster F of a semester. I'm still not recognized for my achievements by my parents to this day. Hell, I'm still peed that my dad has never said that he loves me, just my mom. He said that he's proud of me, but only once or twice. If you reach the end, thanks. I did reach the end, and let me share a few of my thoughts. First, your family sounds rough. No kid should have to deal with that kind of treatment from parents or siblings, and I'm sorry you had to. I'm glad you were able to find friends who saw what a rad person you actually are, though I would still suggest therapy if that is an option. Therapy is good for anyone, honestly. I'll also just leave you with this. If your parents can't see how rad you are, then maybe their approval isn't worth getting. The family that matters is the family you choose. Those friends who support you and understand you, they are the family that matters. Your parents are the ones who have been burning bridges with you, so maybe they should be the ones working to repair them. Story 2. 
The whole, but he really does love you, hit me hard because that's what my mom would always say about my dad. He would constantly say I wasn't strong enough, wasn't smart enough, would get so irrationally angry over the seemingly smallest of things, even punish me for things I didn't do. Or if he was in a good mood, he'd make jokes about the family that sounded like it was coming from a bully. I remember being 13 and he laughed that I was getting a third piece of garlic toast and he called me thunder thighs. That destroyed me, and I just ate less and less at dinner because if I was the first one done, I could leave the table and go do dishes instead of having to be around him. I did my best to not let it fester into an eating disorder, but I did develop a snacking habit. And what makes it worse is that my mom magically forgets everything and goes on pretending that it doesn't happen in front of her, or that he does it to her as well. It really just made me realize that I can't trust her to support me around him because she's going to play peacekeeper and pretend nothing is wrong or immediately forget it. Story 3 can definitely relate to the my parents treat me like a child one. My parents have always dismissed and shamed anything I've said to the point where I'm unable to hold a normal conversation without them denying what I say. Like I'm not allowed to have any opinions or emotions. They treat me like I am far below them and it has caused me to become very closed off. I don't share what I feel with anyone because I fear they will respond the way my parents do. I invalidate and shame myself for my own feelings, tell myself I'm a brat for being proud of or starting to love myself, I'm overdramatic for crying about something, etc., ultimately convincing myself that I'm incredibly inferior to my peers. It's a horrible feeling, and I've been going to therapy for quite some time, but it's hard to fix this mindset and quit bottling everything up. Hey, you're looking into therapy, you recognize issues, I think you are making progress. It might just be slower than you would like, which is unfortunately almost always the case. I know it sucks to say stuff like give it time, but yeah. Maybe also look into another therapist if you aren't connecting with your current one. I don't have much to go on, and my advice isn't super helpful, I know, but I believe in you. Story 4. When my parents got divorced, I primarily stayed with my manipulative mother. At the time, I thought she was protecting me from this person who didn't care too much about me. My mother would often convince me that I was missing remembering certain events, like times she hit us kids or times we may or may not have screwed up. Anyways, after the divorce, I had banned concerts, which meant the whole world to me. My mother had convinced me that my father had never showed up to any of my concerts in the seven years I played, and I believed her since she had hands around my memories and perception. After two years of multiple therapists and a massive falling out with my mother and now living with my father, he tells me that he had shown up to all of my concerts, whether he worked or not, he made the time. Apparently my mother had rushed us out fast enough where we never saw him. It's now left me questioning if any of my memories are even true or if they happened, and I'm not sure if my father and I will ever have the same relationship as the one we had before the divorce. Story 5 Probably just all of the shame I had as a kid. When I was in middle school, I was first starting to really delve into the concept of fandom and fanfiction, something I still love dearly to this day. My mom's husband caught me up late writing fanfic with a friend one night, took my tablet, and left. The next day, my mom started loudly reading what I'd been writing aloud to my household. Like, wow, mom, thanks. Now I'm afraid to tell you what interests me, because that might get done again. I still love writing both original and fan fiction, but I would never show her something seriously romantic that I've written, even if it's for the novel she doesn't know I'm working on, because there's still that constant underlying fear of being loudly humiliated for it in front of my entire family the way she did last time. I also never send anything I write to her husband because I don't effing trust him at all. I get it, if you're upset because I was up past my bedtime on my tablet, that's fine, but punish me accordingly for that. Don't embarrass me in front of the older brothers that young me idolizes because of the things I enjoy. Now I'm afraid to tell anybody about my love of fandom and fanfic because it went so horribly the first time it happened. Call me overdramatic all you like, but this was seriously traumatic for me. I've known my group of friends for years, and only very recently did I start talking freely about fanfic around them because of my fear of something like that happening again. Luckily, my friend group is lovely. They'll gently tease me from time to time and joke about the cursed fanfics they've found or written, but they'll also let me blabber on and on about my current projects and good fics I've read recently. Hell, one friend, as it turns out, is just as hyper-focused on fanfic as me, so we'll sit and blabber about it together. Happy ending, I suppose. Hey, sounds like you found a family of friends that you can better trust because that move by your mom and her husband is just awful. 
I try really hard not to be too judgy of parenting because it is hard to judge a parent by one action, but that one action was really a huge breach of privacy and trust. I don't blame you for being upset. I do think it is awesome you're writing at a young age and will tell you to never lose that passion because it's awesome. Story 6. My mother's logic was to continuously insult me throughout my childhood in hopes that I would want to prove her wrong and fix whatever she thought was a problem on my own. I genuinely can't remember a time where I felt that I had made her proud, only that I was a disappointment and couldn't do anything right or be anything she wanted me to be. One of the most common examples of this was her outwardly insulting the way I looked, telling me I was fat, pointing out my stretch marks, scars, or acne, etc. When I was little, I can't remember ever looking in the mirror and judging myself for any weight or anything like scars, scratches, or anything. I only remember thinking about how much I loved dressing up old girly, wearing nothing but pink, skirts, dresses, tights, and only thinking about how much I loved wearing that stuff. As I got older and kept hearing more and more of her crap, I'm just about to turn 19 now, I struggle with body dysmorphia and go to extreme lengths to avoid my own reflection. I can't stand looking at my own body, having to shower is a borderline nightmare, and I can't bring myself to believe any compliments. My mind is firmly set in a belief that everyone is lying to me, that they're only being nice to avoid hurting my feelings, and that they actually think that I'm disgusting, ugly, fat, stupid, a terrible artist, a terrible singer, anything you can think of. I hate living like this, but I don't think this will ever change. Don't effing do this to your kids. It's cruel, and it will eff them up for the rest of their lives. You're going to think that they're going to forget everything you said, but they won't. I can promise you from experience that they will never forget what you did. Story 7. The story about teasing kids about crushes and stuff low-key resonated with me. When I was 7 or 8, I would come home from school and my dad would ask, How many boyfriends have you got now? Every day. It got to the point where if I felt anything towards someone of the opposite sex, whether they were friends or not, I wouldn't mention it to my dad because he would accuse me of dating them. I was seven and barely even knew what dating was. I didn't open up to my dad already because of the way he treated me. Borderline abusive crap, but now my parents are divorced and I live with my mom. Still a minor, giving no more info on age. But he discredited my feelings towards friends and crushes. I never realized how much it messed with me until the line between they're your friend, and you like them kind of blurred together, and it was kind of hard to figure out how I felt. I found it funny. He asks how many boyfriends I've got. My dad's a craphead, so he might have been implying I was a boy magnet slash Essie because his mom thinks about my mom, and she probably thinks Essiness is hereditary. FYI, though, my mom is in no way at all Essie. She is a hardworking, loyal woman, and my grandma has no right thinking that BS about her. But he gets all wannabe overprotective dad when I talk about boys and he hears it. Another one that I related to a whole F-ton, the one where their dad squeezed their knee until they cried. My dad does that. Whenever he does it and doesn't stop when I ask, I've started just slapping the crap out of his hand. I refuse to cry in front of him because he makes fun of my feelings whenever I'm vulnerable around him, but at least he doesn't squeeze my little sister's knee like that. He's an idiot a lot of the times, but he's figured out that if I react the way I do, my sister will too. Don't know why he still does it to me, though. I have a real problem with parents prodding with the how many boyfriends slash girlfriends kind of jokes. First off, jokes are supposed to be funny, and that crap is so old and overdone that it wouldn't be funny if a tap-dancing monkey said it with his butt. Second, the parents who do those jokes always seem to do them a lot, like an amount that always registers as friggin' creepy as hell to me. If literally any other adult kept asking a kid that as a joke, you would want them to be put on a list. What's your school rumor that turned out to be true? Viewer's edition. After reading some truly wild school rumors, we asked you all what secrets your school couldn't keep hidden. And goodness, did you have some stories to tell. Let's get into it, but uh, content warning, many of these stories will touch on sensitive materials such as self-termination, pedos, and statutory R. Story 1. Not a juicy rumor, sadly. Rather, a dark and depressing rumor that I found out was 100% true. It was that my middle school was trying to cover up the fact that students were killing themselves and that our school had the highest rate of self-termination of students in the entire city. During my last three years of middle school, I was introduced to this rumor because of an odd disappearance of ninth grade class photos from the big photo wall. 
Our school was made up of three buildings, and the 7th to 9th graders went to the biggest building, while the kindergarten up to 3rd grade was in another building, and the 4th to 6th grade in another. The big photo wall was a big wall in the lobby of last year's building, which showed the classes for those that graduated from the school each year. The odd thing was that some years were missing classes. The classes were set up in Class A, Class B, and sometimes Class C and D, depending on the number of students each year. However, certain years were missing classes, as in one year had B and C but no A, while another had A and C but no B. I asked this question to my friend next to me, and another kid from my year's class B told me that the class that was missing was his sister's class because a boy from that class had apparently killed himself. I didn't really know the kid well, and he was known to be a trickster and liar, so neither me or my friend trusted him. Fast forward and a girl from my class suddenly stops coming to school and is homeschooled for over two years before she finally comes back during the second half of ninth grade. I didn't question it at the time and just thought that she was behind in some studies and had to take extra classes. After graduation, however, that girl came and visited my house along with another friend of mine. I hadn't seen her in nearly a year since we went to different high schools, so I decided to catch up. Somewhere in the discussion, I asked why she wasn't around during the last couple of years and she told me confused that it was because an older classman who she was good friends with committed self-termination, and she was severely depressed because she had known him since kindergarten. I was shocked because I hadn't heard anything about that, and my other friend only knew because she had informed her. The girl was confused because she remembered asking the teacher to tell her classmates why she stopped coming to school. The teacher had said nothing. I asked what class he was in, and she told me he was from Class C. I checked the school yearbook, which is supposed to show all classes that were in that year. There was no Class 9C in the year above us in the book. But the biggest confirmation of this rumor came to me in a way that actually affected my family as a whole. My little sister's best friend killed herself by jumping off a cliff. She went missing the night before, and people from the entire neighborhood were looking for her the whole night, including my father and mother. I remember waking up in the middle of the night, hearing the front door open, and being greeted by my crying mother. I remember just being in shock outside my sister's bedroom as I heard her and my crying together. My sister and that girl had known each other since kindergarten and was basically like a second daughter to our family and a second little sister to me. I still don't know why she did it, the same with her family. Fast forward a year and it was the last year for my sister before graduation. My sister and her friends, which was basically the entire class because she got along with everyone, had asked the principal if they could include a framed photo of her for their class picture. He had responded to them in a very unsure and awkward manner and even asked in what she described as almost mocking, Are you sure that's a good idea? Do you really want to do that? Are the others going to be okay with that? My sister came home peed that day. The entire class was in on it and she spoke to her in such a tone about a dead friend that they wanted to be part of their last picture together. My sister and her friends brought a framed photo of her anyway and had it during their graduation. We waited months for the school yearbook to see my sister's class only to discover that my sister's class was not included in the yearbook. It wasn't even on the school's website. Some friends from a year under my sister's had apparently sent her a picture of the big wall and she showed me and my parents that her class, which was class A, was not on the wall but class B was. Around a year after I graduated high school, my mom was talking about a discussion she had with a colleague from her job and she ended up mentioning my sister's friend. The lady then proceeded to ask, was it blank middle school? My mother said yes, and the lady said, don't surprise me. Apparently, out of the 19 middle schools that exist in our city, that school has the highest student self-termination rate out of all of them, including the one that is located in an area that is said to be the worst place to live in the city because of all the criminal activity in said area. My middle school had a higher death rate than a criminal-infested school area. That is just heartbreaking to hear, and it leaves such a bad taste in my mouth hearing about the school trying to keep it under wraps. I mean, I guess it could be out of concern for the students not wanting to have pictures to remind them of such a tragedy, but it feels a lot more like brushing it under the rug and pretending it didn't happen, which isn't healthy. Like... If your school has such a high rate of students taking their own lives, maybe you need to invest in counseling, look into the cause, things like that. Trying to just hide the fact that it is happening is treating symptoms, not the disease. Story 2. A math teacher at my old school slept with one of her students. However, the kid recorded it on his phone and had sent it to his mates, who spread it everywhere, so soon everybody knew. 
Up until then, she was the teacher who everyone liked and respected. She was married to one of the other teachers everyone liked. And the school basically sent letters out saying it wasn't real and squashed the rumors. A few weeks later, I was out with some mates when one of them brought up this story and said, you know he was underage, right? Apparently, my mate knew his family, and not only was he underage, but the teacher had guys to assault the kid, steal his stuff, and make him delete the video. And this was like the third time she'd done it. Story 3. I went to a private school for kids with learning disabilities, ADHD, Down syndrome, Tourette's, etc. It was honestly some of the best years of my life. Until one day it was announced that the school was closing due to lack of funds. This struck all of us as weird as the school got a big cash donation from a local brewery that had just moved in town and wanted some good publicity. Rumors began circulating about where the money went until a few weeks later we found out from one of the teachers that none other than the school's superintendent had been embezzling funds. One of the parents worked for the city, did some digging, and discovered the crime. If that wasn't bad enough, the superintendent was using the funds to make statues of herself. So... Not only was this superintendent embezzling from a school, but from a school for students with learning disabilities and making statues of herself. That is the behavior of some kind of cartoon evil mastermind. In fact, frankly, I'm not even sure if I could see a comic book villain doing something like that. Like, Lex Luthor would kill Superman and steal 40 cakes, but stealing from a school for kids with learning disabilities feels like it would be even too much for him. And that's saying something. Story 4. When we got to middle school, our group was feared by grades above us because the first day of school we had three fights in two hours, so our teachers were also nervous to have us. Anyway, this one teacher was rumored from a past 7th grade group that he was an aurist. When we got to him, creepy as F. So, halfway through the year, people began to look into it. One kid found five vapes and some Viagra plus weed and crystal. Then another kid found intercourse picture albums, and his phone doesn't have an unlock, so somebody went in and looked in his photo album and found pictures of women being aard, and unfortunately a picture of a young child. Our teacher was always late to class and study hall, so in total, this gave students about 15 minutes per day to check this crap out. Anyways, somebody called 911 the day we found the inappropriate pictures and they showed up and we were sent on a major lockdown and then he was arrested. I believe he got about 20 years, my mom said, but I can't remember. Anyways, apparently he had changed his name and disguises three times. Her started arring in California to New York to, for some reason, Indiana, where he was caught by 12 to 14 year old kids. Story 5. When I got into secondary school, UK, so 11 to 12 years old, I immediately knew there was something up with my tutor, as he was giving the female students weird looks and getting angry at the guys for no reason. When two students started dating and he found out, he made a new seating plan that put him at the back of the class and her basically in front of him. My suspicions were fully confirmed when my friend did an autism awareness speech in each tutor and he was just staring at her chest the whole time. Nothing came of it even after we reported him, but a few years later when he said a student's dress was too short and that he needed to take photographic evidence to show the head principal, only issue there was that the vice principal's office was next door to his classroom. After that, he was highly suspected, and around a year later, he was caught upskirting 14 to 15 year old girls during a mock exam. Police searched his phone, search history, and computer. They found upskirt photos of multiple students spanning back years. CP and his home and school computers search results relating to incest. He had three kids, and also a search from the day he got caught saying, Can the police take my phone as evidence? I was so happy when he got arrested, but he ended up getting bailed and only got 10 months probation. He did lose his job and rights to see his kids, though, plus he's never allowed to work at any school jobs or any jobs that involve interacting with kids. The fact that he got away with 10 months probation is just gross, but sadly not surprising. What is most infuriating is how long it took the school to actually do something. Years. It took them years. How is that even remotely acceptable? I know I don't know all the info, but like, it just seems like there needs to be better things in place to protect students. Story 6. In my sixth grade year, we had a science teacher who throughout the year had the habit of losing students' homework, thought to be just unfortunate coincidences at first. 
When I was approaching the last month of the year, I ended up running into that situation where I knew 100% I handed in my work, but the teacher said I didn't. I said whatever, I was the kid that didn't do homework half the time anyway, so I didn't really care. But then, a few days later, a girl that I sat across from who was uptight and only caring about school and focusing on it and getting straight A's ran into this issue, and I sat there and listened and watched her cry after she tried arguing with the teacher, which at that point made me realize that there was some BS happening. After that class, I went directly to the front office and filled out one of those complaint forms used for students if there's bullying or anything, but I used it on the teacher. The next day, I get called down and the vice principal scolded me for doing that and told me to never do that again. So I moved on and as the year ended, found out soon into my seventh year that she got fired for that very reason of losing students' work and unintentionally lowering grades of students. It's been 20 years since that happened, but I would love to run into that vice principal. He's now the principal of the school, apparently, and just ask him about it to see if he remembers. Laugh my butt off. Story 7. Does anyone remember the national murderous clown incident in the U.S. in 2016? Well, not long after those started happening, rumors went around school that one of the clowns from the news was going to target our school. The rumors quickly became true as someone made an Instagram account with a creepy clown as the profile picture and started stalking various students' profiles, even DM'd them creepy threatening crap. The closer it got to Halloween, the more these picked up, and soon the person running the account started saying to look for him on Halloween because he was going to come to school with an axe and presumably kill the students he'd been stalking. The harassment had been going on long enough with dozens of students that they were terrified enough to report it to the admin. We went into a stage one lockdown that day while the kids watched the account to see if there would be news, and there was. The guy posted a picture of our school mascot statue with the caption, I'm here, and everyone in class freaked out. Admin did catch the person running the account, though, a bit of online tracing, a student at our school that thought it would be funny to threaten our school with light terrorism. Supposedly, he had a hatchet and a clown mask in his backpack and claimed he only meant to scare a couple students with it. He was arrested and sent to the prison school in the building next door, DAEP, basically Juvian High School, rolled into one. Even assuming that the student was truly just trying to scare these other students as some elaborate prank, there is a not-so-fine line between a prank and breaking the law. Don't do crap that involves terrorizing people for weeks on end with threats to their life. I feel like that should be pretty obviously so far over the line that there can be no doubt to not do it. Is a prank like that really worth screwing up your whole life? How bad was your roommate? Viewer's edition. Oh man, I've had, well, really only one bad roommate in my life, but after having to wake him up with a golf club to clean up the kitchen he flooded after not doing his dishes for two weeks, I feel like I can relate to you all, at least a little. Story 1. One of my favorite roommate stories to tell. In my junior year of college, I lived with two girls that I went to school with. This was during the summer, so my roommates had gone to be home with their families. It was just me in the apartment most of the time since I was in the process of moving out and needed to pack. My roommates would drop by from time to time, but I was mostly on my own. One night, one of my roommates came back to the apartment, cooks dinner with some grilled peaches for dessert, this becomes important later, stays the night and leaves the next morning. When I woke up, I saw that my roommate hadn't put anything away from when she cooked the night before. We're talking dishes piled up in the sink and making it unusable, ingredients left out, and the griddle she used for the peaches sitting on the counter dirty. I was going on vacation in a couple days and texted my roommate to let her know. Turns out she was out of town and wouldn't be coming back for a week, so I had to wash her dishes. The best part about that was when she grilled the peaches, she made some caramel for them, so the griddle was covered in hardened caramel. I spent the night before my vacation cleaning the kitchen and scraping old hardened caramel off the griddle because my roommate left the apartment without doing a bit of cleanup. The fact that you were in the process of moving out makes me want to say that you should have just ordered out and left the mess for her. Seriously, that's so friggin' inconsiderate. Also, folks, if you are cooking a bigger meal, clean as you go. Seriously, you think it's a lot of work, but there's so much time when you're waiting for a minute or two to flip something or stir something. Use that time to clean. Makes it feel like the cooking goes faster and there's less cleanup after, so cooking doesn't feel like as much of a chore. Okay, this video cannot turn into life advice from Mr. Fax. We gotta move on.
Story two. I had a rough home life. Dad left when I was two, mom left when I was 11, and from 11 to 19, I had a physically and very verbally abusive caretaker. Circa 2017, I had a chance to move down to Atlanta with some friends I'd met online six months prior, and I took it to escape from my home life. At first, it was fine. It was four of us guys in a three-bedroom apartment. We curtained off the living room and made it the fourth bedroom. We were supposed to be a gaming house where we all made content and grew our channels together. Only three of us made content, only two of us streamed, and I was the only one trying to improve all around. First red flag. Eventually, the guy in the living room got a girlfriend, and after visiting on and off, she practically moved in. Second red flag. They would do it almost all the time. She was never quiet, and neither was he. I was unfortunate enough to share the wall between them and my room, so I would be forced awake every single night. I got absolutely zero sleep, averaged five hours per night, when they would F. I would always ask them to turn on music or bang on the wall to keep them quiet, which they never did either. After driving home one night, after weeks of this happening and almost falling asleep at the wheel, I decided it was time to take action. I asked my landlord what it would take to get him kicked out. He just said, we all three needed to vote on it. I went to the other two guys with my complaints, and they were shocked and peed at me for even asking that. Third red flag. A week later, they all voted and decided to kick me out. I had 30 days to find a place, but had about $150 in my bank account. I even loaned one of the guys $100 just so he could buy some groceries, because without it, he wouldn't be able to eat. That was a mistake, because when I asked to get it back, he told me to F off. With no money, I had to live in my SUV. So, for all of April of 2018, I was completely homeless, hence my username. I heard that the day I left, they couldn't afford my portion of rent, though, and were kicked out a few months later. That girlfriend, by the way, stole my roommate's Xbox and all $300 in savings he had in a safe. That's karma for ya. I'm actually still friends with one of the guys, but the other two can go eat a bag of D's. Story 3. Content Warning. R. Scroll to the timestamp on screen to skip this story. I used to live in a house with four roommates, co-ed. It was fine until we got a new guy roommate that kind of sketched me out. Guy was an a-hole and treated his girlfriend like a slave. One of the worst moments of my life was when I found out he got one of our female roommates completely wasted and proceeded to R her when she was starting to black out. She was not into guys and it traumatized her so much her family came to move her stuff out the next day. That is when I found out about it. I was a few doors down and had no idea, and that tore me apart. I saw the girl a few years later in a mental health ward when I was visiting someone else. It was a coincidence. I wrote them a letter just saying I wished I could have done more and that I hope she's okay. She wrote back thanking me, talked a bit about that night, and she managed to get professional help. It's been 10 years, but I still have that letter. She never pressed charges against the guy. I wish she did, but that is, of course, her choice. But uh, last I heard, the guy was in prison for selling... C. I hope he rots in there. To hell with that guy, and I'll join you in hoping that he rots in prison. What a monster. I do know that it is her choice to press charges or not, but I would encourage any of you to get some support from those you trust and press charges, as it's not just for your sake, but potential future victims. But also know that if you were too traumatized and didn't press charges in the past, you aren't responsible for your assaulter's future actions. That person is. Story 4. Had a roommate in junior slash senior college who gave me trouble from the first day I met her. She made a big deal about making sure I was a clean person, told me she couldn't stand living in a dirty house, but would routinely leave dirty band-aids on the couch, food stuck to kitchen counters, dishes in the sink, etc., The worst was a bloody razor blade she left in the shared shower after presumably partaking in SH. She bullied me any chance she got, routinely told me I was a bad and dirty person, and tried to schedule an intervention between the two of us and the office staff at our campus apartment. She finally crossed a line when she scared my best friend's cat, prompting the cat to scratch her. Admittedly, it was pretty bad, but still, and threatened to kill the cat. She said she would get lawyers involved in everything to have the cat put down and went to the office to tell them that living with the cat was like living with her aurist. We took our pets out of the apartment for fear she would hurt them, and when she realized she didn't have access to my best friend's cat or my dog, she poured dish soap in our fish tank, effectively killing all 17 fish we had in there and flooding the apartment in lemony suds. We called the cops on her and she was forced to move out of the apartment, and that's the last I've ever heard of her.
Thank God. Story 5. Once I hit a roommate that was an ex of mine. We remained friends at that time, and another roommate who I was kind of into, and she was into. I had the upstairs room, as she had a bird that would do well in the living room with the curtains open for plenty of sunlight, although she ended up keeping those curtains closed all the damn time. Long story short, the other roommate decided he really wasn't keen on her, and me and him got along as friends, at least. She was so jealous of our friendship growing based on our mutual growing disdain slash dislike for her that she insisted he helped her move all of her stuff upstairs to my room and all of my stuff downstairs to her room, Got about a quarter of the way done and gave up upon realizing that my room was smaller than hers and her stuff wouldn't fit in there nicely. Plus, due to her weight, the floorboards would sink inwards when she stepped on them and did not feel super safe for her to walk around in. Genuine realization on her side, not a criticism about her weight. Made him move it all back down and proceeded to sulk at me when I got home with me only finding out later why. Apparently, she was upset that he'd come into my room when I was sleeping, he gets insomnia, something crazy sometimes, to use my PC. He didn't have one of his own at the time, but was saving for one, and wanted him to do it with hers instead. A fact I find actively hilarious, as one of the reasons we broke up originally was because she would be on her PC at all hours of the night, even to the cost of her own health, and I cruelly and shockingly suggested that she maybe not be on the PC if she was both ill and tired because I actually cared about her health. Okay, and just kinda wanted her to stop complaining about how tired and ill she felt both online and out loud constantly, and she snapped back that I should just stop caring then. Found that way too easy, apparently. It was the final reason for my breaking up with her at the time. He would have literally never been able to be on it. While I am all for remaining friends with an ex if you're able to maintain a healthy relationship that way, even really good friendships are tested when you become roommates. Healthy breakup or not, I don't think you could ever convince me to be a roommate with an ex. I guess it could work for some people, so not saying it isn't possible, but... So far, this little bit of evidence seems to support my position. Story 6. When I was in college, I had a roommate that would take the cardboard rolls out of the toilet paper and leave the toilet paper in a pile on the floor. The other three of us didn't know why, and when we asked, he got mad and stormed off. My film major roommate and I put a camera in my room, he split a room with me, and when I went to class, we turned it on. He was taking the rolls and using them to smoke. Later, I noticed the very expensive laptop he'd brought was missing, and then later his TV. He started staying out longer, and when he'd come home, he'd be so out of his mind that we'd have to carry him to the couch. One day, his mother showed up and asked to speak with me, and asked me about his belongings that were missing in his behavior, saying she'd gotten a call from the school that he'd been missing a lot of classes, and that we'd reported him missing a few times. We had, including that week. Now, I cannot bring myself to lie to a person's mom, so I told her what I knew about what was going on. She asked me to call her when he finally showed back up, and three days later, I called her. She showed up within ten minutes, she'd booked a week at a local hotel, and snatched him up off the couch, screaming in front of all of us, my one roommate's boyfriend and the girl I'd been seeing. She dragged him out, and we didn't see him again. Flash forward a month, and I'm at my parents' house on a break, and his mother calls me. Apparently, he'd gotten on several drugs in the short time he was in our apartment and had sold his possessions to get drugs. She and his aunt put him in rehab. Story 7. Yep, having roommates you know nothing about is a bad idea. Friendships can also end by being roommates. Out of six of my closest friends, only three of them would I ever want to be roommates with. I couch surfed two to three days out of the week to get peace from the drama that is my family. I hardly ever slept on the couch. I would usually sleep in the guest room, their bed, or they would sleep in the empty roommate's bed or simply share their bed. Two of my friends said I couldn't stay over. From the few times I visited their homes, I got the vibe that they're mothers as to why. They don't do anything around the house to help, and an extra body will just add to the pile of housework. From the others I wouldn't stay over with, I quickly found out that he relied on his twin brother. He kept losing his job because he was irresponsible and remembering his schedule. He would also put off doing things until his brother would get after him for it. As for his brother, who is also my friend, he is the cleanest of us. Always getting things done as needed and never putting them off. He cleans dishes right after eating, puts stuff away after he finishes using them, has a set schedule for weekly vacuuming and cleaning the bathrooms. My other two friends are good at keeping up with the housework. 
One of them just needs a bit of motivation and will gladly do the work if he gets help. However, unlike our very clean friends, these two and myself have a habit of having what I like to call an organized clutter. We tend to be like two-year-olds that don't like putting stuff away because it's a hassle to just take it out again the next day. This isn't done in a common room. We each have a room dedicated to console or tabletop gaming in our homes. The rooms are not dirty. They just appear messy because of the clutter. I never actually had roommates, but I definitely heard how bad it was with the first two I mentioned. Friendships were put to the test. Eventually, they were told to pack up and go back to their parents. The third one, his brother, eventually kicked him out too. It's like I said, not even pretty good friends are necessarily compatible as roommates. People have their own ways of living, doing things, all that stuff. You move in with a really good friend thinking it'll be all fun, but suddenly you realize that you hate having dishes in the sink, but they prefer to just do big loads of dishes by hand once or twice a week. It seems like just one little difference, but there are usually a lot of those differences. It isn't easy. Crazy Secrets That Kids Are Hiding, Viewer's Edition Ah, kids hide the darndest things, don't they? And you told us what your kids were hiding, or what you hid as a kid because prompts are meaningless. Not complaining, I'll take what I can get. Story 1 I found my super secret email address that I created when I was 10 without my parents' permission. I know, how horrible. In my dad's password saver, and it scared the crap out of me. I don't know why I was so scared of my parents knowing I had an email, but I guess it was a thing that was for me and me only, to separate myself from my parents and make accounts on social media without them knowing. Additionally, when I was in 5th and 6th grade, my friend and I had lots of secrets with each other. My friend would often talk about them in the backseat of my parents' car loudly, and it always freaked me out. That same friend also texted me, OMG, did you hear that actor was gay? We were both queer too, but I was very closeted at the time. I wasn't exactly subtle, though. And my dad saw the text when he was waking me up. So after I had breakfast, he asked, who is actor? And I panicked and said I didn't know. And finally, the last one. In fifth grade, as mentioned before, I was very queer but very deep in the closet. I had posted about it on my social media and my younger sibling found out about it. My sibling didn't know anything about what being queer meant or what outing was, so they loudly said to my mom, She's bisexual! Note, I no longer identify as bi, but at the time I did. And I freaked out. I got so scared. My mom brushed it off as, You're too young to know about that stuff. A year or two later, I officially came out to her. She didn't care and was surprised, which surprised me because, once again, I was not subtle. And then somehow my dad found out, despite me never actually telling him. I'm really thankful for living in a supportive household because, yikes. I'm just happy to hear that your family was supportive of you coming out. That's awesome. But, yeah, as a kid, it is weird in hindsight just how obvious we all were about our secrets. And honestly, I'm typically way more surprised when my parents didn't know I was lying. Also, it is still weird hearing about kids growing up with email and social media. I guess as a teen, I had ICQ Instant Messenger. I still remember my ID number for it. Anyway, moving on. Story 3. Trick for certain bathroom moments. You know exactly what I'm implying. There is usually a switch next to the light switch, and when you turn it on, there's a loud humming sound. Keep it on throughout the time. Step 2. Sweat 2 has a smell and sticks to surfaces, bath mats, toilet seat, anything. Sit on a dirty towel that you know you'll use later. Try not to leak onto it. Step 3. Make an excuse. Say you're going to shower. I know this is the part that sucks, but play shower sounds through your computer slash phone slash tablet. You'll have to mute your video, but honestly, just watch something or look at images. When you are done, take some of your body wash or shampoo, put some into your sink and or toilet. Also, that loud humming sound is a ceiling fan built into it. When you are done, speed run the cleanup. Wet your hair, put the towel on, place the computer in a very creatively hidden space, and wait for about 10 minutes. Get into your clothes, make an excuse to go to the bathroom, retrieve the gear, and haul. Easy. <laughs> this is the most work I've ever heard of someone putting in for this particular activity. Few questions. First off, why are you playing shower sounds? Just 
Take a shower. <laughs> Frankly, some of you need one. No offense, being a teen is weird and tough. We all smelled a little back then. Also, the shower takes care of cleanup and sweat and stuff. If you fake a shower, I promise an adult can tell. The bathroom isn't humid. The mirror isn't fogged. Just, I need to move on. This is too much. No more questions. Story 8. As a kid, I couldn't sleep on car rides like my siblings, but I would close my eyes and pretend since my parents would always ask if we were asleep. I thought I was supposed to be asleep and wanted to make them think I was. I assume they knew because I didn't really overhear anything too crazy, just work discussions, a little family drama, and occasionally a comment about myself. Whenever we hit a particular patch of road near the house that was extra rough, I would know we were close to home and pretend to wake up and ask where we were. Whatever conversation they were having would stop, and they would bring up something else, like did I enjoy the trip, or if I slept well. I tried to be inconsistent when I would wake up, but I was almost always on the same stretch of road. When we got home, my siblings usually got carried in, but I would try to help with the luggage or anything else that they needed. I liked to get the mail, too. But I always felt like I had been part of the grown-up's conversation. Story 9. When I was seven, every day after school, I would sneak my dad's back massager out from under his bed and lay down in my room using it on my pants for years. I wonder where my parents were. They were home, I think. I also got a TV in my room when I was seven in 1996-ish. And trust me, I soon discovered we all got the premium channels. My mom was an overnight nurse, so every weekend my dad would let me stay up all night. When I found Showtime and HBO, I knew I had the jackpot. Obviously, kids today use their smartphones and hide it. Pretty much every kid looks up adult entertainment on their phone, just in case your parents didn't know. If I could hide mountains of adult entertainment on my family's home computer at age 10, you can only imagine what kids hide today. And let me tell you, once you find out and find out the true nature of children, you were one once. Your eyes open. Ah, back in the 90s, when we could hide adult entertainment on the computer without our parents knowing because their generation is composed mostly of Luddites. But kids these days, a lot of your parents know how to use computers, and there are so many things working against you. I'm sure you must have your own hurdles to overcome. Story 10. My younger female cousin is a thief. Not a kleptomaniac where she can't help it, just a straight-up thief. I don't remember how old I was, but my grandparents, me, my mother, and bro were living with them at the time since we had moved from New Zealand to London. Read my parents' divorce, so that's why we moved. Got me a funky little Lego-adjacent toy set for my birthday where the parts were all round ball things with slots where you could make dolls and animals and crap by stringing them together on their rods and sliding in parts for arms and legs and other bits for details. I also don't remember what they were called, and if someone knows, it'd be great if you could remind me. Said thief cousin basically pestered me into taking it upstairs so we could play with it. I didn't want to, but she kept trying to take the box so she could play with it, and I just gave in to get her to leave me alone. We made a small mess in my room playing with it. It was kind of fun, and then the time came for my cousin's fam to go home. Getting around to cleaning up the toys and putting them back in the box to find my cousin stole all of the parts shaped like flowers. All of them. She also stole some of my little animals from the animal rescue toy set I'd gotten in New Zealand, where it was like a mother dog and her three pups and some other ones, like a horse with three little baby farm animals. She stole one baby from each set. And no, I never got my stuff back because she's a effing weasel who either played dumb or straight up denied doing it or just forgot she did it, and knowing that they came from a family that has no grasp on the concept of material wealth i.e. they threw out a barely used sofa instead of selling it or offering it to a family members when they moved houses. She most likely also threw them out too, and to this day I'm still effing peed off at her stealing my stuff, and now I effing hate lending any of my stuff to anyone. But it seems karma has spun its head around and bit her and bit her hard. Since the last news I got from her is she got locked into a lease on an apartment with her F-wit ex-boyfriend and some of his friends. You've really held on to that grudge if it goes from the age of playing with Legos to an age where you're leasing apartments. No shade, I'm sure you've got your reasons. I'm just imagining as she's struggling more in life, one day you'll see her on the streets asking for change. She'll see you and be like, cousin, can you help me out? And you'll just look down at her and say, maybe you could buy some food with those flower toys you stole from me. She'll look all confused and then say, 
the ones your dog ate? And then you'll realize how wrong you've been all this time. Help her out and you'll start a business together selling toy flowers and become best friends. See, I guess you were wrong about her. Or maybe she sucks, I don't know. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.